And welcome back. I hope you had a good networking session. How's this technology working for you? Excited to have you at the Bay Area Battery Summit today. And we're going to kick off straight away into our first use case for an hour and a half. We'll have a panel on facilitating an evolving grid, which is very much what Elliot and Julie were just talking about in our keynote fireside chat. Um, to get this panel going, we'll call on the moderator first, and I'll just introduce him so that he can then introduce the other speakers. And it's great to have Eric Sure um, presenting this panel, moderating it. He's the Director for Grid Systems and Components at the US Department of Energy. So I guess he works under the Assistant Deputy Secretary who kicked off the Bayer Battery Summit yesterday. And Eric is somewhat of a rock star in the scene there at DOE and in this space. In fact, he was named recently as a young and rising star by Public Utilities Fortnightly. He's um, responsible at BOE for cutting edge research and development of new grid hardware tech, including energy storage, obviously, but also robotics and power electronics, how it all mixes. He previously held positions at Nexans, A123 Systems, and the FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, which Elliot just mentioned, the Order 2222, which we should all become familiar with as a real market driver for this space and the evolving grid. Um, and lastly, Eric, his bio in, concludes with his degrees in public policy from UC Berkeley and computer science from MIT. So um, over to you, Eric. Thanks for hosting this panel. Great. Thank you very much, Danny. Um, and thanks to New Energy Nexus, Lawrence Livermore, uh, and all the organizers of this wonderful conference. It's been, um, it's been a great experience so far. So um, as you heard from Michael Pesson um, yesterday, um, the Energy Storage Grand Challenge has a vision and mission um, for the U.S. to become the world leader uh, in energy storage utilization and exports with a secure domestic uh, manufacturing supply chain. Um, and part of this leadership uh, is to create a use case centered or user centric uh, goals for energy storage technologies. Um, and we will spend this hour and a half uh, with a set of very great speakers exploring a little bit more of the first use case, which is facilitating an evolving grid. And if my presentation is up, someone let me know if that's working. Um, I'll set the stage a little bit. So facilitating, so the ESG vision, mission and addressing key challenges, you heard from Michael Pesson yesterday. So innovate here, make here and deploy everywhere. We're trying a relatively novel approach for DOE to coordinate R&D across all of the different elements of the department. Um, and so we've identified through the Energy Storage Grand Challenge Roadmap, a uh, half a dozen user-centric use cases. So these span the gamut from generation to end use and off-grid applications. Uh, and some of them have very well-defined business model or uh, market values, and some of them are less well-defined or loosely defined. Um, and one of the biggest um, sort of uh, innovations about this is that we're no longer advancing a technology for its own sake. Um, we're identifying uses that are beneficial to end users in different domains, and then crafting technological requirements and an R&D strategy to get there. So here's an example of how we are mapping use cases to functional requirements. I don't expect you to read all of these, but at the on the top here, you see this mapping of the six and a half use cases facilitating an evolving grid. They're mapped to specific performance goals like uh, duration, uh, ability to provide black start, uh, or what kind of lifetime does the technology exhibit? Is it scalable, compact, flexible, modular, et cetera? And then we are doing a secondary mapping from these goals to all of the categories of different technologies uh, that could potentially satisfy these requirements. And this is part of the framework that we are establishing within the challenge uh, to identify the best candidates uh, for technologies to meet the uses that will be required in the future. Another way to visualize this is that um, the market for storage and flexibility technologies uh, could be described by these six use cases uh, in 2030, uh, depending on which projections you follow. It could be uh, single digit billions to double digit or triple digit billions for annual capex for stationary storage applications. 
that would be split among some number of firms. And to get there, uh, we need to validate a certain number of technologies um, across the categories that Michael mentioned yesterday, bidirectional electrical, chemical and thermal, flexible generation and load. Now, we understand that there's not one pathway to the cost and performance targets for these applications. And the facilitating and evolving grid use case, which is the first one and probably one of the largest, uh, includes drivers uh, that uh, come from increasing adoption of variable resources or dynamic changes in customer demand. Um, we're looking at a levelized cost of storage metric for the potential price targets um, down in the three to five cents a kilowatt hour. Um, and that translates to about an eight to 10 uh, fold decrease over today's prices. So 80 to 90% decrease uh, over the standard all in system costs today. And if you look at the kinds of materials that are most prevalent, um, the battery based materials are up here on the right hand side. Um, but if we want to get to very long durations, we might need to think about other materials like salt or air or water um, that have uh, much lower cost characteristics as you scale up in duration. Another way to look at this um, is to examine the cost characteristics over duration for two relatively, relatively well characterized technologies today. Uh, lithium ion and pump storage. Again, these graphs come from a different part of DOE, ARPA-E. And you can see that uh, pack-based architectures like lithium ion have some sort of uh, asymptotic um, behavior as you get out to very long durations, whereas uh, other technologies where you can just increase the size of a tank um, have, uh, a, a, a have a cost characteristic curve that does take advantage of longer durations uh, to dramatically lower the levelized cost of storage. So we expect that um, at longer durations, um, there could be uh, a variety of technologies that uh, would satisfy these requirements. And then just as a final note, um, that's uh, part of what we are looking to accelerate here at DOE. If you look at um, the sort of value chain of technology development from uh, materials, components, devices, to system integration, then operations, markets, and end of life, um, there's activity in a wide range of technologies from flexible generation in buildings to thermal and chemical uh, storage technologies to again, uh, electromechanical and electrochemical storage, including the batteries that are very widely deployed today. And all of these boxes denote where activity is currently happening and being supported uh, within the uh, Department of Energy. And as you can see with all of these different pieces, this is part of why a, a, an overarching umbrella strategy for energy storage has been so important in terms of making sure that the, all the different pieces of DOE are aligned in a way to maximize the speed at which these technologies can be developed and deployed into the marketplace. So today, um, I'm excited to explore a little bit more of this, uh, this first use case, uh, potential pathways to very long, sort of to longer duration applications in the, in the facilitating facilitating an evolving grid use case. Um, our first uh, speaker will be Ramya Somathan from uh, Malta. And I'm excited to hear about uh, the commercialization pathway from her because she brings both the developer and capital markets per uh, perspectives. Um, at Rye Development and FFP New Hydro, she advanced new hydro projects from FERC licensing to late stage development and before, she was also at UBS, where she managed over 10 billion in transactions with a focus on public power clients. She brings these experiences to Malta, and this is a perfect place to start. So Ramya, uh, when you're ready, the floor is yours. 
Thank you, Eric. Let me uh, start by echoing your comments, just thanking the organizers uh, of this conference. Uh, it's a terrific uh, chance for all of us to learn a little bit, not only about um, different technologies and different approaches, but also I, I found your comments extremely interesting. And I think you'll see some resonances to some of the comments you made uh, throughout my prepared remarks. And then of course, in conversation later on. Um, as Eric mentioned, I'm the CEO of Malta. We are developing a technology that is focused on a thermal approach to long duration energy storage. So let me tell you a little bit about the technology. So the original insight, the original technical insight that made the Malta technology possible was actually had um, local to the Bay Area. It was a professor at Stanford named Robert Laughlin, um, who's a theoretical physicist, um, who had the insight that if you took very well understood uh, subsystems, that is a heat pump on the charge side, a heat engine on the generation side, and put thermal energy storage media in the middle in the form of molten salt on the hot side and a coolant, a commodity coolant fluid on the cold side, and you integrated the system, what would result would be low cost, long duration, grid scale energy storage. So let me share some of the headline numbers as we think about it, and you'll hear the resonances to Eric's comments. Um, certainly on the low cost part, we are very aware of future projections for lithium ion and uh, are orienting our commercialization path to be at or below $100 a kilowatt hour installed. Um, in terms of duration, um, very critical to this discussion, um, the sweet spot that we see in the market right now for long duration is in the 8 to 24 hour range, but there's no technical barrier from Malta's perspective for this technology to be used as long as 100 or 200 hours. So the right way to think about the Malta technology really is as a daily or weekly cycle, not really as seasonal. And although, again, there's no technical barrier to using it below eight hours, there is no real cost competitiveness in that market segment. And the reason for that is really the cost curve that Eric showed you um, uh, where uh, he uh, referenced pumped hydro storage. And, um, you know, one of the first things that uh, I heard about Malta when my path crossed the project, which was actually incubated at X, Google's moonshot factory, was think about Malta like pumped hydro storage, but without the hydro. It's not a bad reference frame to think about the Malta technology because like pumped hydro storage, the um, duration, the energy component is actually the cheapest part of the system. And it's very easy to extend the duration at a very low incremental and nonlinear increase in cost. And then finally, grid scale um, of the three things I said, low cost, long duration, grid scale energy storage, we're focused on the 100 megawatt and above market segment. So let me tell you a little bit about how the technology works. In charge mode, as I mentioned, it operates as a heat pump. You have electricity coming in from any source, really. It's agnostic as to the source of electricity. In this chart, it's depicted as the grid, comes in, drives a motor, and you've got essentially a closed loop air loop in the middle. Um, and uh, the, um, the compressor, which is at the front end of the system, compresses the air, transfer, essentially that hot air transfers the heat through a heat exchanger to the molten salt, which then stores the heat. That same air loop passes through a turbine expander, the air becomes cold, and the cold is transferred then to the coolant fluid. In that state, the system can sit in a state of charge with very little degradation for about uh, two to three weeks. And when the marginal value of the electricity is needed back on the grid or for the customer's use case, in the discharge mode or generation mode, the system works exactly in reverse. And rather than being driven by a motor, drives a generator uh, and reconverts that thermal energy back into electric energy. Just a couple of things I want to emphasize about um, the technology uh, and then happy to spend the rest of the time talking about use cases. But in terms of the technology itself, what I'd like you to remember as we talk um, through the rest of this panel is that all the different subsystems of the Malta overall system exist in a very robust manufacturing ecosystem that includes design, manufacturing, construction, operation, and maintenance. 
And they are all well-known, well-understood standard industrial components, turbines, compressors, heat exchangers, pipes, valves, pumps, and the salt and the coolant are themselves used in other applications, some uh, including in the power space at this scale, at these temperatures and pressures. Um, the, the important part about the technology really is to think about um, the customizability and the modular nature of the different subsystems. So not only do we like pumped hydro storage, decouple power from energy by being able to increase the duration by just adding more salt and more coolant, actually the charge and the discharge are on two different power trains. So we're also able to customize the charge power and the discharge power using the same modular technological components specific for the use case. And what I can tell you in that circumstance is that we have had customer encounters and engagement in what I consider pretty diametrically opposite use cases. For example, in a standard solar diurnal cycle, you're looking to charge and call it a six to eight hour window and then discharge the rest of the day. If you're looking for a true 24 seven, you know, solar green electron delivered um, uh, uh, situation. And by increasing the rated power from a symmetric system on the charge side, the multi system can accomplish that. Equally, we've heard the exact opposite use case uh, and are working on a customer situation where the intent is really to trickle charge and then discharge very quickly to take advantage of power price peaks. And because of that decoupling of charge and discharge, we can service that with the same modular components. The last thing I wanted to just point out is this asymmetry, the decoupling between charge and discharge really results in a much higher ability to maintain a higher state of charge, which is depicted on the middle chart here where a symmetric multi-system, which is depicted in blue, is compared to a double system on the charge side. And what you see is that you achieve a higher state of charge in that case in a typical duck curve type environment. And therefore the megawatts that you're able to discharge from the system also depicted in red on the bottom uh, chart of this three, three slide analysis. Uh, conveys that you're able to discharge a lot more megawatts. So the customizability in our view for the customer's use case is really core to the project of this panel, which is serving an evolving grid with different customer needs. Thanks so much. Um, next up we have Colin Wessels. Um, I'm lurking, looking forward to hearing about storage innovation pathways from Colin because he is living that journey today. As the founding CEO of Natron Energy, he has led its sodium ion battery technologies from concept to UL listed product. Along the way, he's picked up four dozen employees, 100 million in investments and grants and 18 patents. So Colin, when you're ready, the floor is yours. All right, well, that's terrific, Eric, thank you. Uh, folks, my name is Colin Wessels. I'm the CEO at Natron Energy, and it's a treat to be with you here today. And let me just start by echoing the, the comments of uh, you know, the, the other speakers. Um, you know, it's been a privilege to participate in this year's summit, and um, the quality of management for the online platforms has been really impressive, you know, beyond what we've seen for, for other conferences this year. So, so thank you uh, for this well-run opportunity. Um, it's ironic that I'm here to talk on a panel about long duration storage because I've spent every day for the past 10 years building short duration high power batteries. And uh, I won't pretend to be an expert in that area, um, but uh, I will share some perspective based on what we've learned commercializing batteries in other markets. Um, so, so with that, uh, let me just start with a quick introduction to Natron Energy. Uh, so we build battery solutions for industrial and grid power applications. Uh, markets like data centers, uh, forklifts that require uh, lead acid batteries, uh, as well as electric vehicle charging stations, which may need batteries to supplement grid power. Um, our products are based on a sodium ion chemistry, and we sell those battery solutions through channel partners that will bundle our batteries with uh, other power electronics components. Uh, we're currently shipping a UL listed product in the data center market. Uh, this is a battery tray that mounts into the server rack and it provides power services for compute, uh, typically uh, on a duration of anywhere from 30 seconds to five minutes. Um, now to go from uh, you know, a chemistry dream to a product on the market took us about seven years, 
first funding to uh, to product launch. And I want to frame my thoughts on on long duration grid storage in the context of existing markets for batteries. Conventional wisdom in our business is to sell car batteries. For decades, starter batteries have been the biggest market for lead acid. And more recently, electric vehicles have become the biggest market for lithium ion. And the result is that you know, the big battery manufacturers partner up with the automakers. And 90% of the startups are trying to replace automotive lithium ion. And the reason is those are the biggest customers today. Now, it is less well known that industrial power is also a massive market, tens of billions of dollars per year. And there are many segments to industrial power, uh, but a few are here. Uh, data centers, um, supply chains, which use electric forklifts, uh, and on the horizon, EV charging services. And what's interesting about these markets is uh, for most of the segments, there are huge customers today that place a very high value on a high performance product. And so for a company like Natron that develops products that are not a good fit for automotive, um, we have a compelling business plan for prospective investors because we're going to existing large customers in these industrial power markets. And the same can't be said for long duration grid storage. You know, today there is no market. And that's not to say there won't be in the future, but today there isn't. And this is a challenge for any new venture. If you're going to justify a business plan, it's difficult to do so without a customer. Well, you might say, well, hang on a minute. You know, the grid may not be ready for long duration storage, but, but maybe I can find other customers in, in the industrial power space. And, and the difficulty there is that there is no high value market for long duration industrial storage. You know, for more than a few hours of battery runtime, I run a diesel gen set. And it's going to be extraordinarily challenging for a new venture to develop a new product from scratch. And then with you know, a nascent small supply chain, you know, hit a cost target that's competitive with diesel. And, and the consequence here is that there are going to be real headwinds to justify finance for a new long duration storage venture. Now, the other thing to consider is the grid's going to change. You know, by the time we need long duration grid storage, you know, what else will have changed by then? And you know, we can frame this question in, in the context of the energy storage grand challenge, the theme for, for this, uh, this week's summit. And, and right here on this slide is figure one from the ESGC roadmap published this July. Um, and we've got the three core areas that, that Eric talked about. Uh, and I just wanna comment on a few of these and, and what they might mean for the grid. Well, with flexible generation controllable load, what does that mean? Well, among other things, more distributed generation. We've got solar on every rooftop. Uh, we're going to have high EV adoption. We don't know exactly what that will do to the grid because we also don't know the extent to which we see vehicle to grid style storage assets. And we all hope that smart loads uh, will become pervasive. We don't know the extent to which they will. Uh, but in addition, there are regional effects. You know, here in California, you know, we're dealing with seasonal fire safety issues that result in planned outages to transmission and distribution. And that could really benefit, you know, increase the need for long duration storage. Now, the other thing to consider is by the time long duration grid storage assets are deployed, there will be ubiquitous short duration batteries. That could be anything from, you know, uh, milliseconds, fast response, uh, to four hour load shifting. These batteries are going to be everywhere. They're going to be supplying services and their ability to do so will impact the value capture for a long duration storage system that might like to uh, participate in both long and shorter duration markets. Now, we're also going to see seasonal effects um, you know, in this area as well. And here in the American West, it looks like we're headed for decades of drought. Uh, that's bad for all of us. Uh, but that may actually be very good for long duration storage because of the potential impact on pumped hydro. And, and the point here is the grid is going to be changing in the next decade in ways um, that may make it challenging for us to predict you know, what would the real demand for long duration grid storage be. And, and to drive this point home, I just want to focus on, on one specific example, and that is short duration energy storage uh, that changes loads on the grid. And the example I'll use here is uh, electric vehicle charging. 
Uh, there are two plots on this slide. And, and the plot on the left shows the load uh, of a station here in California, real world station um, with four chargers, uh, direct current fast charging. So this is up to 62.5 kilowatts per charger, current generation. Uh, and what we see is peaks throughout the day. We've got a spike of power at lunch. Folks are leaving work to charge their car. Uh, we see spikes in the evening, you know, 5, 6 p.m. Folks stop for a charge uh, on the way home during their commute. So that's intuitive. And for a current generation station, 150 kilowatt peak load, that's something the distribution grid can handle. But that won't be true for a next generation station with 350 kilowatt chargers. You know, at that point, we're going to see a megawatt peak load to the grid. Um, and the grid won't be able to provide that megawatt to all the stations. Uh, so what do we do? Uh, well, the answer is in the plot on the right. And shown here is that same power load to charge the cars you know, in orange. And whenever we've got a spike in power, we discharge a battery. Now, in this case, it's a 20 minute battery, short duration storage that handles all of those peaks and load to the grid. Now we make up the rest of the charge power for the cars with uh, power from the grid. And we also recharge that battery, that stationary battery during station downtime. And what we find is the load to the grid is much smoother and it's 50 to 70% lower depending on system sizing. And I point this out not to make the argument that batteries at charging stations alone are gonna dramatically change the market for long duration grid storage. But I point this out as an example of the other ways in which the grid will change in the next decade. And that introduces uncertainty for the long duration grid storage market. And so if you put it together, there's some real challenges here. We've got no extant customers. You know, widespread demand is likely 10 years away. Uh, we've got near-term technologies that will change generation and load profiles in ways that will alter product requirements, you know, both cost tar targets and performance specifications. Uh, they're gonna change. And there's a lot of uncertainty here that we don't see for other uh, battery ventures in other markets, such as automotive, such as industrial power. And the consequence is that new technologies for long duration storage will not be attractive to most of the private investors who fund new technologies, because there's just so much risk here on the market side. And so if you're a stakeholder, you know, on the grid that truly cares about having long duration storage, you may need to step up because the investors that have historically funded batteries into other markets may not do so for long duration storage. So with that, I'll turn it back over to the moderator. Thanks for your attention. Great. Thank you, Colin. Um, yeah, so finally, I'm Thrilled to hear more about energy storage safety. It's a key segment of the commercialization pathway. Um, and our speaker is Harish Kamath from EPRI, who's a veteran uh, in this field. And his experience is literally out of this world. Uh, from work on spacecraft batteries at Lockheed Martin to nearly two decades of storage research at EPRI, Harish has made important contributions to the commercial success of storage like co-authoring the DOE EPRI Storage Handbook and crafting the EPRI Energy Storage Integration Council. With that, Harish, when you're ready, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Eric. I really appreciate that. Um, it's a pleasure to talk to you all this morning. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to present at this uh, uh, excellent conference. And uh, um, as, as Colin uh, said, uh, I think very, very well run. Uh, it's also a pleasure to follow Colin and his uh, uh, insights uh, today. I think uh, it's, it's really refreshing to see um, uh, some, some uh, thought around that uh, and, and very much in line with uh, a long duration skeptic uh, like myself. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today with uh, energy storage is uh, taking these technologies, whatever technologies we have, whether they're long duration, short duration, and using them to uh, actually uh, apply to the grid. Uh, and that uh, to, to do that, we need a collaborative research approach um, that we think uh, uh, we can help facilitate, but will obviously require a lot of people around the industry. It will require the participation of uh, a number of, of uh, uh, different agencies in the government, in, in state and federal level, uh, and will require also the participation of uh, people on the industry side, both from the user's perspective and from the uh, technology developers. So uh, 
before I do that, I'm gonna uh, just talk a little bit about, about who we are. We are the Electric Power Research Institute. We are a 501c3 nonprofit research organization doing public research, public interest research in energy and the environment, uh, organized to advance a safe, reliable, affordable, environmentally responsible electricity for society. Uh, through global collaboration, thought leadership, and science and technology innovation. A lot of words to say, we're trying to do this for uh, society. Um, we're trying to make sure that the technologies are available because we believe electricity is a public good uh, and that uh, having access to uh, electricity is something that can only make the world better. So our role in that uh, is as a facilitator, as a catalyst, if you will, uh, we try to bring requirements over from the uh, utility side uh, and feed them back to basic research and development, and which will then get transferred into technology commercialization, ultimately become products for the industry. And we try to facilitate at every point there. We take the requirements and feed them back. We uh, help with the technology transition to commercialization. Uh, and we also work with uh, solution providers to make sure that their products are safe and reliable uh, to the degree that is demanded by the utility industry. And so we work with uh, all of these companies to stimulate innovation and accelerate uh, technology development. So specifically with respect to energy storage, we see two major reasons why we're interested in energy storage on the grid. Uh, the first is here and now, uh, reliability and resilience. Uh, electricity is becoming only more vital every day to uh, the uh, society that we live in. We want to make sure that that electricity is available where you want it, when you want it. Uh, and uh, for customers to have access to that, we believe that energy storage uh, presents a very good opportunity uh, to make sure that they have that. It's already been used in backup applications for a number of years, uh, mostly on the customer side. And now we have the opportunity to use it on the grid side uh, cost effectively uh, at scale smaller than pumped hydro. Obviously, we've had pumped hydro for a long time. But in addition to that, there's the intuition that we will need energy storage to achieve some of the very high goals that we have set for ourselves in decarbonization. So achieving the 100% renewable and net zero carbon goals, uh, we believe that that's, uh, will require energy storage to do it. This is the technology that enables both of those goals. Uh, and driving that, uh, that adoption on the grid side uh, is certainly policy and regulation. We've seen procurement targets and we've seen new market designs trying to encourage uh, energy storage adoption. That's really coming out of customer and societal change. Uh, people want clean energy, uh, and so they are trying to uh, expand their adoption of renewable energy, which makes storage more valuable. Uh, but in addition to that, we're seeing uh, the effect of uh, disasters, uh, various types of natural disasters. Uh, we see, we talked about the wildfire, wildfires earlier today, uh, and uh, we've also heard about other uh, disasters, hurricanes, um, all types of uh, natural disasters that are affecting the world to a greater degree than ever before. Uh, energy storage can help uh, make the grid more resilient and more reliable in those in those circumstances. We're also looking at uh, economic transformation. Uh, cost reduction of lithium ion is certainly a big part of that. Uh, other batteries as well, uh, which are learning, uh, taking uh, uh, advantage of that learning curve, but also the development of markets that compensate energy storage services. And then finally, all of this is really uh, built on top of uh, the uh, advancements in technology that are making this possible. If you had told me uh, 10 years ago that we have a level of research and development uh, that we're seeing in energy storage today, uh, if we would see that in 2020, I would have been skeptical about that. And certainly I think it would have been unthinkable uh, 15 years ago. We've seen a tremendous increase in this area, uh, largely as a part of, of uh, the recognition of these, uh, of these various things. Still, uh, there are a lot of research questions to answer. And if any of you have seen a presentation from me in the last 10 years, you've probably seen a version of this slide, which really hasn't changed all that much. Uh, we see a lot of effort uh, addressing this upper left-hand corner here, energy storage technologies, people talking about batteries, uh, thermal storage, uh, even hydrogen. Uh, these technologies are very important to explore, but they're only part of the solution. We have to actually take those solutions and integrate them into the grid. And a lot of times, those uh, that integration is something that's a, uh, a little bit of an afterthought. Uh, there's a balance of plant uh, a characteristic of that in the lower left-hand corner there, establishing requirements for things like thermal handling uh, and uh, uh, controls, battery management systems, things like that. Uh, actually installing storage systems in the field, which requires uh, 
us to have a standard process for siting, permitting, installing, uh, transportation, all those things, making sure that we understand safety and environmental issues, not just safety and operation, but also safety uh, in if something actually happens in a contingency, a contingency situation like a fire, what uh, are the effects of that? What, what are we going to see in terms of, of uh, emissions? Uh, we need to understand those questions. We need to understand communications and control of these systems. We need to understand how uh, to standardize the interface with the grid. All of these things are being addressed right now. Uh, and, and quite frankly, not to the degree that we would like them to be. Although we've seen tremendous advances in energy storage in the last few years, uh, and as uh, Julie said earlier today, uh, it is happening all over the world all at once. Uh, one sad thing about that is that we've really not seen too much data back from many of those installations. People say they installed the storage system, then we hear, never hear from them again. Uh, and we wonder why that is. So those are things that you know, we really need to address at some point. Uh, what we've done at EPRI is take some of those technical gaps and turn that into a roadmap. And this roadmap is available, it's uh, free to the public. Uh, at the EPRI website, you can see the uh, link down at the bottom. You can just search for that number and you can download it. We have these five areas, safety, electricity, reliability, economics, environmental responsibility, and innovation, where we see a number of gaps um, in, uh, in, in the field. Uh, that we would really like to make sure that we address as an industry. And so we've actually developed these together with uh, utilities and other stakeholders uh, in this process. And uh, uh, we're hoping that we can work together uh, with everybody in the uh, industry for that. And, and towards that end, we've developed a research program at EPRI to try to address that uh, in areas including analysis, technology, implementation, and operations. Uh, we're doing this very much as an a, uh, uh, industry engagement approach uh, with a number of different stakeholders. Uh, we're also looking at environmental issues and uh, asset management uh, specifically for the owners of energy storage. Uh, we're trying to, to develop all of this thing through government industry collaboration. And towards that, we have a new uh, initiative called SPARTA, Storage Safety Performance and Reliability Technology Accelerator. Uh, we're working uh, with a number of agencies, including DOE, to try to understand uh, how to best address all of these gaps that we just talked about, to accelerate technology validation uh, and adoption, to enhance energy storage safety performance and reliability in the long run. Uh, we do believe very strongly that energy storage uh, has a role to play all the way across the uh, uh, electricity supply chain. As Colin said, we expect the storage will be ubiquitous uh, and it will be providing flexibility uh, for renewables as well as reliability and resilience all the way across uh, from generation down to uh, end use in microgrids, commercial and industrial and, and residential. And for that, I'll uh, look forward to the panel discussion uh, to talk about how we're going to make all that happen. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ash, and thanks to all of our speakers for their insights. As we move to discussion, I'd like to invite the audience to begin submitting their questions to the chat function. Um, so to, to wrap up, um, the presentations, you know, Natron and Malta have both identified technologies with an eye towards market and financial constraints. Uh, they gave us a peek uh, into how their companies have refined their upstream R&D strategy uh, in response to downstream considerations. Uh, and Haresh has looked at how utility considerations on storage are rapidly evolving. Uh, these presentations speak to the different aspects and approaches to crafting storage technologies for a rapidly evolving grid. So I've got a couple questions here for the panel to get us started. Um, so Rame, you discussed divergent use case requirements among your potential customers. You said uh, potentially diametrically opposed functionality in some cases. Um, how do you balance the diversity of customer needs with the cost reduction to come with standardization of hardware? I think that's a terrific question, Eric. Um, and the way we address that really is in modularity of the subsystem. So let's talk a little bit about the, the three, what I identify as sort of the three components of the system, right? Charge, storage, and generation. And I'll, I'll take the storage media first um, because that in some ways is the simplest one to explain. And very much like a flow battery or like pumped hydro storage, it's very possible to kind of change the duration uh, exactly adjusted for the customer's use case, either in different use cases um, for different customers or potentially even as um, an ex post facto change to a system to just add duration. Uh, that's equally possible. I think your question is really focused on the charge discharge, charge generation, decoupling, and how it works 
do kind of have diametrically opposed use cases in terms of rated power on the charge side or the discharge. And at Malta, the, the um, response to that really focuses on the modularity of the components and using them uh, in a way that really increases or changes the rated power for each side, but ultimately relies on the standardization of the subsystem provided. So in that sense, it's kind of a step function for the customer. It's not infinitely customizable. It's not specific, but it is very possible to change the rated power to result in different asymmetric charge discharge profiles using the same modular system. Great. Thanks, Rami. And then Colin, any thoughts on um, this customization versus standardization? Yeah, I mean, that's been extraordinarily challenging for you know, battery systems in every market. And just to give you an example for what we deal with with Natron, you know, there's no strategic advantage for us to vertically integrate and offer all the other gear in the data center. That's just not a non-differentiating part of the platform the data center uses. Um, so we don't commit, commit the resources for that. But then the consequence is, you know, I need a battery where I've got different flavors for different system integrators. You know, I've got, a, I've got great for Schneider Electric, I've got Cherry for ABB, whatever it is. Um, I've got to have a change in the core product to integrate the battery into the rest of the, uh, the power infrastructure. Um, so there's nothing new here in terms of what you know, grid storage or and even specifically long duration storage um, technologies are facing as you, as you run into these cases where um, you know, different customers require different types of products. Um, now, what do we do in response to that? Well, the answer is we have to be super selective about which customers we choose to work with. You know, if it takes engineering resources uh, to work with a new customer, it, that really needs to be weighed against the magnitude of the, uh, the commercial opportunity. And you know, we've turned down partnership opportunities with strategic partners um, who, who would be serving data centers that just don't represent big enough customers for us in the long run. So you know, if you're fortunate enough to get to the point that you've got a core platform like Natron does or like, or like Malta does, um, and then the next step is you know, find a way to identify a subset of customers for which even though the product they want is different, the additional engineering work to serve the second, the third, the fourth customer with a different flavor is not that much work. Mm -hmm. And that's the prioritization game we have to play. Interesting. Yeah. It's, it's, so not only are you choosing, is there a technology choice, but you are also choosing your customers and markets uh, intelligently. Um, actually, so I, I, um, uh, I wanted to go uh, touch, uh, touch on Colin's great discussion about the extent and magnitude of potential changes over the next decade. Uh, and I'm, I'm gonna direct this question first to Paresh in his role at EPRI, um, sort of with your perch across the utility industry. So if I could borrow a phrase, like what known unknowns are you most concerned about over the next 10 years and how might that influence this industry? Well, well I think the biggest, un uh, biggest known unknown right now uh, that I think that the utilities are all uh, looking at is safety. Um, you know, it's, it's, a big, it's a big challenge. Um, and, and it's not really, um, you know, I, I think that they're, they're looking at it as, as a potential issue because they've heard of a, a number of different uh, you know, issues specifically with lithium ion batteries. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but the fact is that, uh, you know, this applies to all technologies, right? Uh, you know, when we have a new asset class of any sort, uh, and especially with energy storage, uh, we have to be prepared for uh, you know addressing all the contingency faction, uh, factors in there, uh, and that includes the fact that you're going to have this this uh, new technology in place, and you're going to be installing it and, and using it for 20 years, and you don't know what issues you're going to be running into in year 15, right? Uh, we just don't have that uh, level of experience with the technology yet. So um, you know, the biggest biggest question that that uh, utilities are having is well, how is that going to perform? over that period of time. Uh, right behind safety is reliability for the exact same reason. So um, you know, having the data available, especially long-term data, is going to be very important for a lot of, uh, a, a lot of the users. Great, thanks, Trev. Um, yeah, building on that point on um, long-term safety and reliability, you know, as part of the energy storage grant challenge request for information, um, we, we received, you know, over 150 individual comments, um, and many of them noted the need for storage devices to match the operating lives 
of co-located assets like wind and PV. So you're really talking about 15 to 20 year uh, bankable performance guarantees. Um, for Ramya and uh, Colin, you know, as relatively newer companies, how do you provide bankable guarantees for the performance and uh, reliability of your system? So, so I'm happy quick. to go first, if that makes sense. Um, sure. So, I mean, I think you're putting your finger on an absolutely critical um, requirement for commercialization. Um, and it, uh, it's sort of irrespective of market, right? So any customer is really going to require performance guarantees, guarantees on um, cost and schedule if there is a construction project involved. And so the, the pathway to having the, the performance guaranteed and wrapped, not only in terms of proof, but in terms of a balance sheet that can stand behind any liquidated damages or other financial requirements as a method of, of essentially um, uh, giving the customer confidence that you're going to be able to make that is an absolutely critical thing for any new company. And so, I mean, I think there are a variety of ways um, that companies like Malta and others in the field are putting their toes in the water, trying to test have different approaches to that. Um, and the cost of each of those solutions also matters quite a lot. So I always think about things like cash, like cash funded letters of credit. You have cash to fund a letter of credit, then why do you need the letter of credit? Right? So in that context, a lot of times, although there are significant new insurance products that will take on the technology risk and wrap the, the performance after a long and detailed process of underwriting and diligence. Uh, many of them remain quite expensive. And so that individual trade-off that you need to make as a company uh, really depends on the underlying technology, its underlying record, the sub-suppliers and what guarantees and warranties they're willing to put on underneath the overall system. And what the, the project, if we're talking about a project development context, which in the case of would typically are, what the project guarantees are in combination with an EPC. So, what I'd say is there are a number of tools in the tool shed to do that, but you're putting your finger on an absolutely critical component that everybody needs to Thanks. Um, Colin, any thoughts? Yeah, I think, you know, Ramya absolutely nailed it. And um, it, this is a challenge. So, so, so just let me just step back for a moment. You know, one thing I love about the, the Malta platform uh, is that there's no new electrochemistry. Correct. It's a combination of technologies that are already well understood. And because of that, uh, you know, it's actually possible to get some kind of warranty insurance product uh, that won't break the bank for the whole business. Now, that isn't true for a battery company like Natron. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for us, and, and you know, we're, we've gone to market in the data center uh, market with a warranty longer than the, uh, the typical lead acid warranties for the incumbents. But you know, at the end of the day, I only have a couple of years of accelerated test data. And so the uh, you know, the insurance policy I can get at an affordable premium uh, is only a few years in duration. And that's part of the reason we've chosen these industrial power markets. You know, if, if the incumbent is only used for, for a few years at a time before it's replaced, not only is it easier for a new technology to convince the customer it might last longer, uh, but we can also access um, you know, a, an underwriter for a uh, warranty insurance policy um, that, can act, that we can actually afford. Mm -hmm. and, and we're just not going to see that for new technologies that go straight into an application uh, for 15, 20 year lifetime, whether it's on the grid or anywhere else. So, so that's going to be a barrier for you know, grid intent battery technologies that we're not going to see for other grid technology platforms like Malta's or new batteries going into other markets for which the incumbents or replaced every that, that's really interesting Colin. so i'm hearing there's a second layer of choosing your customer because uh, based on these uh so i'll call them ancillary financial considerations of um the available track record and kinds of guarantees you're able to cost effectively afford yeah, that's correct eric interesting so do you see some kind of a um uh sorry i'll come right back to you Ron. do you see a kind of um progressive or laddering uh, pathway where you actually get up to 10, 15 years of, uh, of bankable? Well, yeah, so, so, so there are two, uh, two angles on that. And the first is, well, does your product actually last that long? Mm -hmm. 
and, and let's be honest, you know, alleged 10 year lithium ion systems are being replaced under warranty all the time on mm -hmm. the grid today. But if I've got a tier one with a bottomless checkbook that's going to give me free replacements, I don't care. Mm -hmm. I, I still take the deal. Um, it's improbable that you know, any startup is going to offer that. You know, for a new technology platform to be able to play in the market that way, it's going to have to be offered by an existing you know, big manufacturer. Um, so, so that's the first issue. Does the technology really work or not? You know, fr from, the, from the perspective of you know, can, you, can you ensure a warranty, you know, um, that's not so hard. And, and we're already seeing this. You know, a year ago, we could afford about a three-year warranty. Now I've got more data. Uh, we can offer a four-year warranty, et cetera. As you get more and more reliability data under real world and accelerated conditions, well, then the market for underwriting that warranty will change hmm. to the benefit of the venture on the condition the technology actually works. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't, well, you're stuck. Stick with the customers that only need a short duration, uh, a short lifetime product. All right. Got it. Ramya, go ahead. I think I stepped on you. Oh, no worries, Eric. I was just going to um, sort of follow up on this exact point, including something Colin said earlier, which is that at any given point in the early commercialization journey of a company like Natron, Alta, like so many of, of, of other innovative platforms out there, you know, the data itself becomes a limitation because, you know, no, you, you don't have more operating history than you've been in existence and likely less. Right. And so what I think is absolutely critical is to break a potentially vicious cycle. And I'm kind of um, harkening back to some of the things that Harish said in the comments, which is a focus on reliability and safety but over, for example, 20 period. And what's absolutely critical is, um, you know, to find a way with customers to understand what could make them comfortable short of a 20 year operating system. Mm -hmm. Right. That's an absolute. If, if the only thing that can satisfy that need is 20 years of operating, then you're automatically seeing that this group of customers is, uh, you know, are going to be addressed in 2040 and beyond. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, and so, by technologies that exist today. Huh? By it's yeah, that we can address, we can satisfy those customers in 24 and beyond with technologies that are in place today. Co correct. And so a critical need, I think, for new technologies and, you know, irrespective of, of who we are or what we do, is a pathway on unit, call it one through four. I mean, call it, you know, whatever you want to pick that number, it could be one through five, one through eight, you know, et cetera, which is that everybody wants to buy unit number eight, mm -hmm. you know, but who wants to buy units one through four? And uh, I think that is the critical question. And or folks like the DOE or others who are really interested in supporting the pathway to commercialization, I think the critical point is really about what happens in units one through four, because exactly what Colin said, the market will take care of offering instruments for what are still early, but more um, developed commercialization, right? If it's a unit four, someone's gonna sell you an insurance product, you're going to get letters of credit. You're going to find somebody who will stand behind you, lend their mountain sheets, et cetera. It really is about those first units and what what solutions, and they're necessarily cobbled together, right? But what solutions can you find that will satisfy the customer, that will, um, you know, are affordable, um, that uh, trade off the appropriate amount of NRE versus product cost? Right, because if I could get a very, very efficient system or a very, very safe system that cost me a billion dollars to prove that out, that trade-off is the one to take. So understanding those trade-offs across time, cross-temporally, mm -hmm. and really understanding that will make a huge difference in the strategic business plan of the company. Right. Yeah, I think I think uh, you know just to just to add to that. Um, uh, you know, Ron, Ron is exactly right, and and, and what Colin is saying is exactly right. Um, you know, a, a lot of people talk about these things in in kind of this rarefied um, environment where they say, well, you know, this battery's got to last for twenty years, or this technology's got to last for twenty years, um, and and some of those expectations are a little bit unrealistic. And if we were to actually build a technology that that did that, we would be basically pricing it out of anything that um, you know we'd be able to afford. 
Uh, you know, let's be realistic about this. Uh, you know, a battery doesn't go into the field and then you walk into a, into a box and you never open that box for 20 years, you know, and expect it to, to, to survive. You're going to have maintenance on it. You're going to do, you know, do some work on it. As, as Colin pointed out, um, you know, there's no, there's no battery that actually lasts. Uh, you can guarantee that lasts for 10 years or, or 15 years. And everybody in the, in the battery industry knows that a 20 year VRLA will never last 20 years. You know, you'll be lucky if it lasts 10. So, um, you, you know, that's, that's just kind of part of the, you know, part of the industry. That's okay. Um, but what we really want to know is what do, what can we expect? You know, can we expect a company uh, to stand behind their product? Can we expect that, uh, you know, when the, the product breaks down uh, on Christmas Eve, uh, you know, two in the morning, uh, in the middle of a snowstorm, uh, that there's going to be somebody who can come out there and fix it because people are expecting their electricity, uh, you know, on, at that time, regardless of, uh, of, you know, whether it's a holiday or, or what the conditions are. Uh, and utilities are operating in that uh, environment all the time. I think there's, you know, that, that level of expectation um, is is going to be there. And, and those are the kinds of, of requirements that we really have to talk about. Uh, a lot of a lot of people want to talk about the financial instruments like warranties, which are great and they're important. Don't get me wrong, but uh, you know, warranty is ultimately uh, you know the financial instrument. What what uh, in addition to that, people are going to really want the technical uh, you know the technical backing behind that. They want somebody to be out there, technicians to be available. Uh, all of those things have to be there, especially when you're talking about a reliability or a resiliency product. Yeah, if I could share a couple of anecdotes on that, like yeah. Early days at A123, um, there was an installation up in Lower Mountain that uh, went offline unexpectedly, and VP of Engineering got in his pickup with his power tools, drove out there and uh, started picking <laughs> for, for a week until it was up back online. Uh, and then on the financial side, like we, we also had a potential transaction with what I'll, I'll call an unnamed utility in a U.S. territory in the Caribbean. Um, and I think the eyeballs popped out of the sockets in the finance department because they said it was the first time probably only time ever where a123 had a higher credit rating than one of its potential customers <laughs> uh, yeah, but those are very far and few between and like having the balance sheet to stand behind your product is uh is definitely a barrier to entry uh we got a question from the audience um and this one i'll, I'll hand over to you correct um the question is, what resources can be made available or more broadly known to researchers who want to shape their work to be more compatible with grid integration, installation, and related practicalities? Uh, well, that's a great question. Um, you know, I, th I think both DOE and EPRI and uh, a number of, of investigators out there have developed uh, 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 resources that are out there on the grid. Um, I've got a big long list of it uh, that's uh, you know largely DOE and, and is, is available to um, you know, to the public, which I can maybe throw up on the screen here in a moment. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, working with uh, state agencies and, and federal agencies, DOE is a great resource. Um, the National Labs are great resources. California Energy Commission, uh, NYSERDA, uh, a, lot of, a lot of states, that, a lot of agencies have uh, requirements that apply to the places that they're uh, you know, looking at. And, uh, you know, it's a great place to start. Uh, also, of course, talk to utilities. Uh, I wouldn't say that the utilities are maybe the first place to go because uh, a, a lot of times uh, it, it really depends on, on the service territory and it depends on the, the specific application that uh, you're looking at for your storage system. And many utilities are, remember, focused on keeping the lights on right now. They're not necessarily looking at uh, the, uh, uh, you know, how to do that in 10 years or 20 years. Um, what we're trying to do is, you know, make that easy for them by making sure that these these uh, technologies are available. Uh, finally, you know, we at EPRI have a lot of uh, information. You can always go to our website at EPRI.com. Uh, we have, uh, especially if you're interested in the integration aspect of this, uh, EPRI.com slash ESIC, the Energy Storage Integration Council, has a great deal of free material uh, with requirements on uh, battery technologies and uh, energy storage in general. It was developed in collaboration with the industry uh, and with industry participants, including the national labs and uh, uh, government agencies. So uh, that's a great resource to have. And maybe I'll uh, maybe I'll share that uh, in a moment here with, uh, with, with um, if you'll let me throw that up on the screen. Sure. Uh, if you've got a, got a moment, I'll keep talking while you get that up. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, while while you're bringing that up, I'll invite 
one more time for the audience to submit any questions uh, through the chat function. We're uh, happy to hear from you and engage in the discussion. Um, and I don't know, Harish, if you have that. Um, one of the things I had um, appreciated uh, in Colin's presentation was very was his very pointed comments that there are no, there does not exist a uh, an, a an, a viable market for long duration storage today. Um, and uh, one of the things I'd like to ask anyone who's who may have thought of that is what kinds of solutions could bridge the gap between sort of this technical need for uh, for long duration storage that we've sort of identified in long long term planning models. Um, and sort of the weakness in the market signals to make those resources uh, viable. So, so maybe I'll start, Eric. Um, no, I, I guess one thing I'd point out is um, it, it's really a question of which stakeholders are going to depend on long duration storage in the future. You know, if, if that's a utility, for example, um, you know, if, if, if we look at the past hundred years, um, there have been technologies with very long incubation periods. Some have been in national labs, some have been in the great corporate research labs of the 20th century, you know, Bell Labs. Um, we've even seen cases with Apple where technologies that ended up in the iPhone were originally developed you know, 10 years earlier. And in every case, effectively, you've got an entity that is a future end customer that is incentivized to keep incubation of, of a new technology platform alive. Uh, that's not the case for the financial investors, which are the primary drivers for new energy storage technologies. And, and so what I would say is, um, you know, if, if I were in the business today, if I were trying to build a long duration storage venture, you know, whether it's a battery or, or any other platform, um, you know, I would try to partner up with entities that are the most likely to be my future customer. If I can find stakeholders in those entities that share my worldview on that, you know, I, I would find a way to help them you know, support the dream until the market's there. But I don't think we're going to see that from, from the rank and file financials that are backing most energy storage ventures. Great. Thank you. Um, and then, Rami, would you? Yeah, would you absolutely. Like I'd, love, I'd love to add just a couple of thoughts here. So uh, I agree with Colin, right, which is that the profile of that technology incubation period is a little at odds with the traditional venture program. Um, and that, that's just an honest acknowledgement. And so the question is, can you think of ways, can, can companies think of ways, as Colin says, potentially with a customer, potentially with strategic investors? Are there ways to get around the, the potential, incompatible, the seeming incompatibility between that incubation cycle technology and the, um, the, and the nature of venture capital? The, the other point I wanted to make is really about, you know, this idea about the market developing at a point in the future. And, and I don't disagree with that. I'm, in the, I, I'm developing a long duration storage technology. And I do not disagree that long duration storage really starts to kind of increase at an exponential scale, 25 and beyond. But we see signs of uh, demand today, um, including, and I, I think it was at the box, you know, including the California SPCA RFP, the RFO that's out. There's a public bid in the United States for uh, eight hour duration and longer products. We certainly see the demand internationally um, where folks are tendering into um, bid, uh, not uh, renewable energy as available, but renewable energy shaped. And therefore, they're looking for long duration solutions to shape that. The critical point I wanted to make is. For these technologies to be available in 2025 and beyond, they must be deploying in the very near term. And I, I want to be very clear, you know, particularly at the scale that is starting to be procured and that we start to be increasing potentially to 2025 and beyond. Because when you are offering a 100 megawatt product, a project takes a minimum of two years to come to shape, mm -hmm. to achieve commissioning. The technology is ready. And so the technology has to be ready. And then you need two years. So I, I just want to be really clear, make sure that everybody understands, you know, the market has to be today if we're looking for a different future in 2025. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, there's a path dependency that leads back to right now. Yeah. So, appreciate that. Uh, Haresh, do you, you have thoughts? Yeah, um, you know, you know, Rami is exactly right uh, on on that last point, which is something that you know, uh, you know, frankly, energy storage has, has been ignored, uh, you know, for so long. It was ignored for so long, and, and when when the industry actually decided that they needed it, um, there really was not that much in the way of technology uh, to you know to actually serve that need. That's why you know they took whatever they could. Uh, which happened to be lithium-ion batteries, you know, that the price is coming down on because of, uh, of uh, the automotive market. But uh, you know, a lot of a lot of utilities would really prefer to have something large scale and something long duration, very much you know, very similar to what uh, uh, Malta is producing, and, and other other companies like Malta are, are producing. So, you know, that that you know, part of the challenge has been that we haven't worked as much on this technology as we needed to, and and that's really you know quite a shame. Of course, we can correct that by working on it now. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I don't think it's too late by any means. Uh, you know, the, the real question with long duration storage is is not so much whether we need it, uh, you know, quote unquote need it, but whether it brings value. I think it can bring a lot of value uh, in, in certain circumstances. It has to have a cost profile that's very, very low cost. Uh, and so I'm actually much more um, optimistic about technologies uh, that, that look at that, uh, that, that that focus on very, very low cost. Uh, at very large scales, and you know, pumped hydro is a great technology. Uh, compressed air energy storage is a great technology. Uh, things like Malta, which are thermal storage, um, you know, is, is is I think a good technology for long duration. Uh, maybe batteries may be a little bit tough uh, in this application, just from a from a cost perspective. So um, you know, I'm not saying that it's out of the question. Just uh, it, it may be difficult. So um, the, the real question is. Can you uh, get to this point where you're storing large amounts of energy for a fairly substantial length of time? Uh, it's a very difficult financial case, uh, and the only way you can do that really is by making a very, very low-cost system work uh, in, in, in some effective way. All right. Thanks, Harish. And before we go to the next questions, which I will, I'll combine those next two, uh, Harish, I'm going to invite you to share your screen uh, this sure. year that you had mentioned earlier. Sure. So I've got uh, one one slide up here with uh, some of the public re uh, available resources. Uh, what I'll do is I'll make sure that I'll add this to uh, my presentation uh, so that uh, uh, all of you out in the audience uh, have access to this. Uh, you'll see that a lot of these are are equity uh, research or you know, things that we've done in collaboration with uh, some of the other um, agencies out there, the California Energy Commission, uh, DOE. Uh, DOE has a few. Uh, Things up there which are which are really quite handy um, from uh, Sandia National Labs, uh, NFPA standard that uh, we've talked about for for fire code. Uh, that's a, a really important uh, um, area that I think everybody should look at. Uh, and then finally, um, down at the bottom, DOE has got a couple of really great resources in their energy storage program, uh, including the energy storage database, which uh, covers all the the projects that are out there. W one other resource which isn't on here that uh, uh, probably should be, is the Energy Storage Association. Um, the Energy Storage Association does a lot of grid-related uh, grid energy storage work, and uh, they, they have some fantastic stuff on their website, which is uh, www.energystorage.org. Great. Thanks, Suresh. Thanks for sharing all of the DOE links especially, and your, uh, your check is in the mail. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I also note that the, the last link that um, that Harris showed in this slide um, also contains a repository of all of the previous annual program reviews for the Office of Electricity. So that's an excellent resource for anyone who's interested in what the Office of Electricity has done in energy storage over the past, I guess, almost decade now. So basically every year we do a peer review of um, every individual project, um, and it's a very, very good uh, place to get consolidated information. Uh, I'm going to consolidate the ne these next two um, audience questions. Uh, Ramya mentioned the CCA activity in California um, uh, as a you know potential uh, for indicator of long duration market. Um, we also have a question on potential collaborations with big tech like Google, Facebook, or Intel uh, for longer duration storage for data center solutions. So I'm going to use the first question, like how big of a market do we need to launch commercial long duration storage market? So I can take a stab at it. I, I, you know, certainly not mathematically. I, I couldn't give you a number, 
right? But, but I think it's important to have a number of different use cases represented in the early adopter. So the CCA RFO is an important indicator because these are retail utilities, they serve customers, and they're procuring hundreds of megawatts. Right, so it shows you uh, uh, a level of seriousness of purpose, the use case, as well as the magnitude that is really important to impress. Similarly, and I, I like the question about um, the, the large companies, because they have taken a leadership position in many cases in stated ambitions about becoming 24-7 green electrons, right? And certainly Colin spoke very knowledgeably about the data center market, so he can speak about it more authoritatively than I can. But the point I'd like to make here is that there is no way to achieve 24-7 green electrons without long-duration storage. That's, you know, and so I, I think that that's a real indicator, not only of the kind of use case profile for a data center, which is you know heavy electricity use, flat load, um, et cetera, which, which, are all, which are all important as um, um, analytic in the use case, but the fact that there, there's a real seriousness of purpose around the 24-7 green electrons mandate is also a really good market indicator. The third point, uh, the third uh, indicator I would use is one that I mentioned very briefly, and we do see this um, uh, uh, quite significantly, are very large IPPs that have hundreds of megawatts of renewables. It used to be that they would um, be able to deploy those renewables on an as-available basis. And increasingly, tenders are describing load shapes uh, or uh, describing requirements for sundown solar, meaning that there's an extra power during the day, and what's really valuable is the ability to generate renewable power after dark. Um, so those profiles are another real opportunity for long duration. So the point I'd like to make here is that, in our view, there are enough indicators even today that scale for the kind of product that we're making that make this enterprise, uh, I'm just talking about us at the moment, um, from our perspective, well worth uh, the risk on, on, on the part of our investors. Great, thanks. Um, Colin or Harish, any thoughts? Yeah, yeah, sure thing. So uh, just to touch on the, the part of this question that's related to the data center market, look, it's true. You know, data centers are two to 3% of global grid power consumption today. They're also growing rapidly. Uh, but if you take a deeper look at the market, you, what you'll find is a lot of the big data center operators are already deploying um, you know, renewables locally. You know, they're solar on the roof. Um, you know, the leaders, you know, Google, Facebook, you know, they're publishing sustainability reports. They're all the things they're doing with their business to minimize the impact on the grid and the extent to which it's still carbon-based power. Um, we are not seeing widespread adoption of, of long duration storage yet. Um, really, the batteries are still being used for compute services, it might be backup during an outage, it might be supporting a peak compute load that's minutes in duration for the most part. Um, but what we are seeing is uh, distributed generation. And I would point you to Microsoft. You know, they've uh, published a lot of work that they've done on uh, deploying fuel cells in the data center, and the grid is the backup for primary generation on site. And it's just a situation where if your business is, is a multi hundred megawatt business, uh, you can actually get to economies of scale with local generation where you'd rather produce your own power than pay for it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's some conflicting trends here in the data center industry, but I'd say they're generally uh, adjacent to the, the market for long duration storage. Great, thanks Colin. Yeah, and briefly, uh, uh, you know, as Colin pointed out, um, you know, there, there are so many things happening here that it's uh, it's difficult to, to just put one, um, you know, one spin on it. Uh, things depend so much on local prices of electricity and mm -hmm. of natural gas, for that matter. Uh, things rely so much on uh, you know local regulatory policy with respect to, for example, energy metering. Um, all of those things feed into. Um, the value proposition for customer energy storage. Uh, if you have a straight uh, net energy metering policy that just lets you put power back on the grid, uh, you know, then there may not be a, a lot of value in long duration storage you know, on, on the customer side. But if on the other hand, you don't have that, you can't, if you have to sell electricity back to the grid at wholesale prices, well, then maybe it makes much more sense 
to store it locally. Um, and you know, the, the value proposition for energy storage goes up. You know, so that's what we're seeing in places like Europe and Australia, uh, where storage is, you know, customer storage is becoming much more popular for, for exactly those reasons. Um, on the, you know, on the flip side, uh, as Colin said, you know, if natural gas is really, really cheap uh, you know, from a retail perspective, then, uh, you know, you might actually do, you know, local generation of fuel cells, a combination of fuel cells and solar or, or something like that, um, you know, depending on, on what's considered renewable too, you know, your, in your corporate goals, uh, you, you may uh, find that it's a lot easier or maybe just, you know, from a corporate standpoint, desirable to have solar panels on your roof, or you may try to buy that from the grid. Um, so the question is, you know, does the storage fit on your side of the meter or do you ask the utility to provide storage uh, you know, on, on the utility scale and just ensure that you're always re receiving 100% renewable energy? Um, you know, the, the, the business is going to evolve a lot uh, over the next 10 years. Uh, and a, a lot of this is going to depend on a lot more than just uh, the cost of the technology or the availability of the technology. It's going to depend on the direction of, of uh, regulation. It's going to depend on the direction of costs of a number of different commodities. <clears throat> so, so just to build on what Harish just said, you know, just, just one other thing to think about in the context of, well, wait a minute, data centers have order of magnitude 100 gigawatt hours of lead acid batteries sitting around today, none of which are dispatched back into the grid for anything in part because of technical limitations, but you could conceive of a replacement, a new battery that could then be dispatched into the grid. Well, it really has to do with the value of that battery. Mm -hmm. you know, if, if, I, if, if I'm going to invest in something away from my core business, and now I'm, in, I'm participating in grid energy markets with the storage assets, you know, the return I get on that has to be good enough that I'm spending resources doing that as opposed to building my core business. And at least in the data center space, these companies are doing well enough that they're incentivized to build their core business. Mm -hmm. They're not incentivized to find a way to take existing storage assets behind the meter uh, and then find a way to dispatch them uh, back onto the grid. And we're a long way from that in, in the data center market just because of the, the financial outlook for these businesses. Yeah, that, that kind of dormant opportunity, I think, um, is sort of emblematic of this this entire industry where I don't know if you guys feel the same way, but it, to me, this point in time in this industry, it really feels like we're on a roller coaster as it crests the very top of the first incline. Um, and it's uh, there's a lot of churn underneath uh, both technology, trends, policy and markets. Uh, and we're not no one's really confident where they're all going to go. But one thing everyone can agree on is that the rate of acceleration is only going to increase over time. So I think it's a very interesting, interesting time. Um, I'd like to close out by um, uh, touching back on something my boss mentioned at, at the keynote yesterday, uh, which is workforce. Uh, you know, people uh, as both a constraint on the growth of this industry and a potential opportunity are going to play a, a um, increasingly uh, important role. Uh, so I'd like to invite each of the panelists uh, to close out by giving us uh, some uh, some quick words of advice for someone new at, um, uh, entering this industry, whether it's a, a new graduate straight out of high school or, or college, uh, or someone who's transitioning into this industry for the first time um, after uh, a length of period of time in, uh, in something else. Uh, so we'll go into order that we um, that the speakers appeared in. So, um, uh, Rami, why don't you go ahead? Absolutely, and um, you know that your your um, kind of headline comment really caught my attention because it's a it's it's a big um, resonance that Malta has kind of globally, which is that when you think about workforce, um, when you look at a Malta system, it actually looks like a pretty traditional conventional fossil asset. And the reason I bring that up is that globally, particularly in the face of shutting, the shutting down of coal plants globally, there are incumbent workforces everywhere that are uh, kind of looking at the future and seeing that their jobs are at risk in the energy transition that's happening everywhere. And one of the uh, opportunities that Malta offers really is to be a third door between the green transition and the loss of incumbent labor force skills because the kinds of things that Malta uses really are very traditional industrial components. 
And so part, so my message, I, I know that you were going to a slightly different place, which is not so much about you know who's working at Malta, um, but in terms of what are the, the workforce related issues that are entering the industry want to think about. I, I sort of have two messages. One is don't discount traditional skill sets. Um, you know, they're very much in need and will continue to be in need. Um, and so if you do come from a traditional gas turbine or, you know, uh, background, know that there's a place in this industry for you. You just have to find it. it, it you know, um, it, it's not, uh, these are not all new skills. The second thing I wanted to convey is I, I think very much the theme of what we've been talking about here today, which is, you know, I, I think it's absolutely essential companies to not just believe that if they build a terrific widget that the market will create it and that they need to prospectively, proactively really focus on the other things we've talked about today, regulatory change, um, financial engineering, commercialization. And so the skill sets needed at every company individually and in this sector globally are very diverse. They're, not, they're, they're certainly science and engineering heavy, but they're also span the realms of policy and regulatory, knowledge and intervention, commercialization, insurance, financial know-how, et cetera. So um, again, my thoughts to, to folks kind of eyeing this industry is, it's a big, big, warm bath. You know, come on in, we need all the skill sets um, because the change that we're trying to expect is gonna take people from a very wide variety of factors. Great, thank you, Rana. Colin, um, words to, Advice for someone new to this sure. industry. So, so let me let me touch on this, uh, you know, in, in two areas. And, and the first is for the prospective entrepreneur. Um, Ten years ago, lithium-ion batteries were a thousand dollars per kilowatt hour. Uh, I remember sitting on panels with Harash, and we were dreaming of the day it would be two hundred. And everyone was saying, "Okay, we're going to get to two hundred by 2020." Well, we got there way early. Um, you know, automakers they're seeing pricing under a hundred. Um, the industry consolidated around the incumbents faster than we thought they would. It, the, the pricing we've achieved is, is about what the asymptote showed, but it happened way faster. And so if you're the entrepreneur, um, start, start a business that's inventing a new product that's an order of magnitude better. Don't make a product that's an incremental improvement. You're wasting your time. You, by, by the time you've brought that to market, the market has already moved. So, so invent something that is an order of magnitude improvement. Um, now, now the other thing I'd say is, uh, what does it mean to, to manufacture batteries at, at giga scale? Well, that's kilotons of material. That's hundreds of kilometers of battery electrode roll to roll. You know, in a big gigafactory, it's hundreds of thousands of cells per day. And you know, our industry lacks the manufacturing engineering expertise we need. You know, so if you're a young engineer, if you can develop a skill set in process engineering, in quality, you know, how, do, how do we turn material science problems into uh, a high quality product? Um, there will be jobs for manufacturing engineers in energy storage. And, and we'll, we, Natron looks around the country today. It, it, this is our number one pain point for recruiting. Uh, so so you know, for folks out there getting into the industry, we beg you to develop manufacturing and engineering skills, uh, come work for us and go work for our competitors to help the industry. Thanks. Um, that's not only good words for new new entrants to this, but also potentially good advice for DOE itself. Um, Haresh, thoughts uh, thoughts you'd share with, to someone new to this industry? Right. So you know, I, I agree completely with both Ron and, and, and Colin. Um, you know, one thing that I will say is that um, you know, ten years ago there was uh, just as Colin said, there were so few people in this industry, uh, and you know, w w one of the things that uh, has happened is that uh, I think that the number of, of people working in this industry has increased tremendously. And, and if there was a single thing, a single um, you know, a single investment that I would point to that has that has done that, I, I would say it would be ARPA E, uh, and you know just the fact that there was a, a availability of uh, you know a a, a a program that funded early scale research uh, in this area just just actually encouraged a lot of folks to go out and uh, you know to 
to get into this field uh, and to, to recognize the importance of this field and to actually to uh, fund their research uh, over the years uh, in this area, even if a lot of that research didn't actually go anywhere, uh, and some of it did. I mean, not to say that, that it didn't, but but you know, even if if all of that, you know, everybody who came out of that uh, had a heck of a lot more experience, uh, you know, with with actually making things work, uh, and so that was you know that was the success that came out of those things is is really um, you know having people with that experience. Uh, that experience and that expertise requires an investment in education. It requires an investment in, uh, in you know, just in technology development and, and uh, innovation in general that uh, has to come from the entire industry. Uh, what's what's really remarkable sitting here on this on this panel, um, you know, we're, we're certainly you know we're funded from from utilities largely, but get a little funding from government. Uh, and I know Colin has, has has received some funding from a variety of sources. And and Malta you know came out of, of, of Google. Google X, uh, in addition to other other uh, uh, investments, it's really great to see the diversity of investments that happened that came together to make this possible, and and that's really what's going to drive, uh, I think, the, you know, the opportunity in this space, uh, and ultimately make people look at this from a career perspective and uh, and say, hey, this is this is worthwhile to get into. Uh, one thing that I want to build on, uh, you know, from from Rangi's, uh, you know, statement, uh, you know, about bringing people in from the existing industries uh, is it's a really important point. You know, we talk about lithium ion, but, you know, we sometimes forget, you know, the reason that lithium ion really took off or that was started in the early, uh, in the mid eighties was because Sony uh, actually took a whole bunch of engineers that they were taking off of their audio tape lines. They no longer needed audio tape because they were going to, towards compact disc. Uh, and they basically said, hey, we want to make world to world battery uh, technology. This is something that's never been done before. Uh, so it's skill sets that already existed that were applied to a new technology uh, and made that technology successful uh, in a way that had never been done before. That's that's amazing. Uh, that's really what we have to think about today. We have to talk about existing skill sets and apply it to a new challenge for the future. Uh, that transformation, enabling that transformation, the fact that you know Sony actually went and and not only threw in four hundred million dollars of their own investment, but also got a substantial investment from the Japanese government at that time. Uh, to make all of that happen uh, is evocative uh, for what the challenge that we face today in actually making this uh, a successful industry uh, is to make sure that we have that that investment. Great, thank you, Harish. And on, on that note of cross pollinization, um, I, I hope you uh, please join me in thanking um, this panel. Um, hope you have uh, gotten as many insights as I have.